let's go to our devotional for today. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. This is probably our key verse or key statement it is by grace you have been saved and god raised us up with christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in christ jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in christ jesus verse 8 for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is the gift of God. A very familiar verse, of course. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. Or in other translations, workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us. I think this is the New International Version 2011. So, there are three things I'd like to share from this passage. I don't know if we'll be able to finish them because I intend to really stop once the timer or the alarm rings or sounds. So, let's just uh, finish where we can. Before I go to those uh, three points which I'd like to share with you let me remind of remind you of the theme it is by grace you have been saved and I think it's very important to go back to the basics to the fact that our salvation is not something we deserve or earn or merit it's a free gift from God and because of that the glory will go to him and we completely owe him everything we, we really owe him everything our salvation is by grace and that will become more clear as we expound the passage so let's try to i'd like to give you the three points number one god's gracious motivation number two god's gracious intervention and number three god's glorious intention so let me repeat god's gracious motivation god's gracious intervention and finally god's glorious intention okay verse 4 as i said the focus will be from verse 4 to verse 7 let's look at what moved god to save us by grace but because of his great love for us god who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions it is by grace you have been saved what moved God to save us what was in his heart and the answer to that can be found in verse 4 it was because of his great love for us and because of the fact that he is rich in mercy which of course points to this amazing glorious character of god god is love and he is merciful let me just make a distinction between the two it seems to me the broader term here is the word love which refers to the affections in god's heart and not merely the affections but his his will his determination his favorable disposition to 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 care for us to really treat us as uh, special and 
mercy, the term refers to God's compassion on those who are in misery. And the Bible is saying here that he, th this is a quality which is abundant in him. Now, the two are obviously related. There is no point. It would be useless to make a sharp distinction between love and mercy. Although I said love is the broader term. Let me just say something more about mercy. The distinction between mercy and grace is uh, this. Mercy is God withholding from us what we deserve. And that is, of course, wrath or condemnation. And grace is God giving to us what we do not deserve. And what we do not deserve, of course, is love, salvation, His uh, favor. So that is the distinction between grace and mercy. At any rate, the important point is that this is our God. He is truly good, truly wonderful, great, not merely in power, but rich in mercy. That's a wonderful phrase. And His love for us is truly great. And the greatness of this love, the... the, the richness of this mercy is all the more highlighted by the fact that he showed us mercy and he what is this showed his love for us even when we were dead in transgressions and it's very important to highlight this in order to show the fact in order to point out this truth that we really do not deserve his love, His mercy, and we do not deserve to be to be saved. Okay? And in fact, it's more than that. We are helpless to save ourselves because we are dead in transgressions. I do not think that in this devotional we will have the time to really dig into the meaning of that phrase, dead in transgressions. But just for the sake of Understanding it a bit further, let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 2 of Ephesians. And it says here, As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. So, dead in your transgressions and sins what does uh, this mean if you look at the passage being dead in sin entails or is related to or includes the following things and that is being under the control or at least under the influence and deception of the devil and because it says here, we are uh, when you're dead in sin, when we used to be like that, we follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So that's another characteristic or feature of being dead in sin. Our disobedience is part and parcel of that. And... It's related also to the fact you cannot discount or ignore the role of the devil in our being disobedient before we were saved. And that is what it means to be dead in sin, or at least part of what it means to be dead in sin. The fact that we are disobedient which is a result to a large extent of being our of being captive to the devil I, I think we can understand more about this if we go back to the garden of eden because that's where it all starts you remember of course that god issued a prohibition a warning 
he told Adam and Eve that you can eat of the fruit of any tree in the Garden of Eden except for one, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You cannot eat of that uh, fruit. And on the day, please remember this, the Lord warned, on the day that you eat thereof, you will die. And it seems clear to me that that is the origin of this phrase being dead in sins and transgressions. So if, if, you, if you go back to that, you will of course remember that the devil really had a role to, to play in Adam and Eve becoming dead to dead in sin. What happened was the devil deceived them and in a sense they became captive to his will. They fell under his uh, influence and on that day they died. Of course, you might ask, well, they didn't really die physically. Well, they died in the sense that their fellowship with God and relationship to him was cut off. And you've probably heard this many times, death means separation. So physical death means separation of the soul from the body. But there's also such a thing as spiritual death where men, human beings, get spiritually separated from, from God. So instead of being in his favor, we end up separated from him and being condemned by him so so let's go on no? so Adam and Eve disobeyed and that was because of the deception of the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient you see my point that actually this passage can be better understood if you go back to the garden of Eden in Genesis no and it now makes sense it's related to that warning of the Lord which says on the day you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil on that day you will die they died spiritually separated from God that reminds me of the verse which says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death but of course spiritual death leads to physical death and later on it leads to eternal death. In other words, the separation from God who is the source of all joy and happiness and fellowship, eternal life, that separation from God someday, if we are not saved, will become per permanent and our miserable condition will be, will be permanent too, eternally. So... That's why we are in a miserable, I, I, I mean, that's why if you are dead in sin, it's really a terrible thing. And going to verse 3, by the way, I think we will only be up to this first point since this is just, in a sense, a dry run, a, a test, and I, don't, I wouldn't want this to be very long. Okay, so let's go to verse 3. We've talked about mm, dead in sin, being deceived by the devil, disobedience, and then there is depravity. This is a consequence of that first disobedience. And this is part and parcel of what it means to be spiritually separated from God, from His holiness, from His goodness. Depravity, being wicked. And uh, it says here, all of us also lived among them at one time. In other words, we're, before we were saved, we were like all uh, these people who did not know God. We were depraved. We were gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. So everything about us became wicked. Not only our actions were tainted by sinfulness 
but our hearts actually and our minds and uh, thoughts everything no thoughts feelings emotions they were all tainted by by sin that's why there's a verse i think in jeremiah that the thoughts and imaginations i, I can't be sure whether it's in jeremiah i think jeremiah says the heart of man is desperately wicked and beyond cure and i think uh somewhere else in the scriptures i think it was during the before and after the flood somewhere in genesis god knew that the thoughts and imaginations of man's heart were wicked all the time that's it we live in such a way because we were dead in sin we lived in such a way as to think merely of satisfying and gratifying our sinful desires not only sinful physical desires it's not limited to lust but it's also the desires and thoughts so sinful thoughts we want to satisfy also our sinful imaginations we entertain envy anger jealousies hatred that's part of gratifying the cravings of our flesh which which uh, reminds me no don't be misled by the word flesh i think in greek this is sarx no s a r x and in other bible translations this term is translated sinful nature to convey the true meaning of the word that it's not limited simply to the physical nature or aspect of a human being it's a it's something deeper it's a principle that permeates and pervades the pervades the totality of our being it just so happens that the sinful principle the sinful nature manifests itself and uses as a vehicle our body to express and make concrete in the real world its uh, sinful intents no or intentions or urges so so that's the connection between uh, the flesh the body and the sinful principle within so just be aware that the word flesh uh, should not be confined to simply the physical aspect of a human being but again the point is this is what it means to be dead in sin and of course god hates sin god cannot tolerate sin and in a sense we are a mass of sin which reminds me of that verse in romans 3 i think which says that uh no one is good uh we do wickedness all the time and uh, even according to isaiah i think no even our good works are filthy rags in the sight of god which which just highlights which just highlights the fact that being dead in sin is really a a ter- terrible state to be in especially when you consider the next uh, phrase which says like the rest we were by nature deserving of wrath in other words we were damned so let's try to summarize no the state of being dead in sin and our purpose is to highlight the greatness of the love and mercy of god how come that in spite of this very wicked state that we were in in spite of this depravity god still loved us when in fact the quote unquote right and just thing for him to do is really to condemn us and to cast us into eternal punishment okay we, we, we'll come to that maybe in the next uh, video teaching session but for now let's go back to this phrase like the rest we were by nature deserving of of wrath the wages of sin is death so to summarize what does it mean to be dead in sin it's to be deceived by the enemy to be under his influence to be captive to his will it's to be disobedient it's to be depraved 
okay wicked and it's to be damned or to be under the condemnation of God you can read more about the condemnation and the wrath of God which he pours out on this sinful world I think in Romans chapter 1 okay we don't have time to go into that but I am just trying to make it clear how miserable our condition is especially spiritually speaking we are totally undeserving of God's love God's mercy God's favor we deserve the opposite we be we deserve to be cast into hell and another thing that needs to be point out to be pointed out is especially when we get to the second point which will probably be two sessions from now another thing which needs to be emphasized is our helplessness because we are captive to the devil's will because we are you know our inclination is to be disobedient and depraved it's it's a given that we are helpless to save ourselves because in the first place we don't love god we have no desire for him we love our sins repentance humanly speaking is impossible for for us that's not something many people like to hear because they think that they are the captains of uh, what's that poem invictus i am i am the master of my fate i am the captain of my soul you know it's just a matter of willpower and a matter of exercising my choice over which i have sovereign control anytime i want to change and uh, repent and come back to god i can do it anytime no matter how depraved i am it doesn't work that way if you consider ephesians chapter 2 and remember the fact that uh, actually we are captive to the will of the enemy and by nature we are children of wrath children of disobedience we have wicked hearts defiled imaginations which are sinful at the time sinful all the time so much so that even if we want to do good we cannot really do anything good the good things we do might appear good to you know our fellow human beings and to a certain extent only as far as this temporal world is concerned the god might even consider good our good works as good for limited purposes maybe for the sake uh, in relation to temporal benefits and but ultimately the bible is correct when it says there is no one who does good the bible is correct when it says that uh, all our good works are filthy rags and by ultimately i mean that anything good we do are filthy rags in the sense that they cannot merit uh, salvation because they're tainted at the root of all our so-called good works and is still sin there's a selfish motivation behind all our good works we cannot really say that we do this for the love of God it's really even though we are not aware of it in the depths of our hearts anything we do everything we do apart from God apart from the Holy Spirit is really born out of selfishness self-centeredness it's it's really all about self but we're not aware of that of course most of us believe that uh, people are by nature good and as I said, just to clarify, in a temporal sense, as far as uh, uh, as far as this temporal world is concerned, as far as uh, you know, making life in this world a bit more comfortable and maintaining civil relations between human beings, then those actions can qualify as good. But as far as God is concerned, no, no, they're filthy rags. They're not good. You cannot do anything to save yourself. Now. You might be wondering what I'm trying to get at. Actually, I'm, I will be connecting this later on to verse uh, 8 and 9, which says that, basically, which says that we are not saved by works. And now it's clear why. It's not clear why. Because we're children of wrath. 
were children of disobedience, were depraved, were disobedient, were under the influence and control of the devil, of the enemy. In in fact, I remember, I think the Lord Jesus Christ called the Pharisees, sorry, children of the uh, children of the devil. You are of your father, the devil. And all of this highlights the fact that if ever God loved us and had mercy on, mercy on us, it's a mystery. It's something stupendous, marvelous, amazing, incomprehensible. If ever God loved us, the ultimate reason will have to be found in himself because he is good, not because not because we deserve his love and that's hard to take because you know we are biased in favor of ourselves but it's important for us to understand this so that we can understand that the that salvation is really by grace it's a free gift received from the lord it's not something we deserve or can earn by means of our good works because in the first place we cannot do any good works no matter how good we think our works are we are by nature and i'm at least as far as uh, our fallen condition now is concerned after eden by nature we are not good we are sinners and that highlights all the more the richness of God's mercy and the greatness of His love in saving us. I hope that this Bible study, this devotional, will be a blessing to you, at least in terms of understanding more of God's Word with respect to our fallen condition and our miserable state spiritually not only spiritually but holistically before the Lord and which leads us hopefully I pray to a greater appreciation of this wonderful and even mysterious love of God towards us in that while we were yet sinners even though we were dead in sins he saved us by his grace